I'm going to introduce you to a framework that Deborah Spar, a colleague of mine, uh, the uh, Harvard Business School, and who is also a former president of Barnard College, calls the four phases of life in the development and commercialization of a new technology. Deborah has shown in a book that she published in 2001 called Ruling the Waves that this pattern of phases that we'll talk about has regularly appeared across time for many of the modern technologies that we interact with. And modern, I don't just mean in the last 20 years, but over the last 100 to 150 years. So let me go through each of these phases to give us a foundation, and then we'll talk in more specifics about some technologies. So the first phase here that Deborah talks about is the innovation phase. It focuses on the research and the discovery, which Deborah talks about as a laborious exploration and the sudden thrill of discovery. It is a phase focused on scientists and enthusiasts that typically spend very little time concerned with anything that's related to a business plan. They are driven by their own motivations in this time and will have ideas about what it is that their technology can do and why it is exciting, but they often don't think past their own motivations, their own interests in this and how that others might take the technology that they're building and use it for other purposes. Um, more generally, because these inventions have yet to exist, uh, there's next to no rules about what takes place in this space, how you can think about using them, how you should think about using them. So that's our first phase here. The second phase is what's called the commercialization phase. And this is when an invention leaves the lab or your garage and enters the public eye. Technology here starts to attract pioneers, profiteers, and pirates. Those interested in staking claims in the new technological territory that is now being opened up. And the most aggressive of them, of course, will be thinking and dreaming of building an empire in which they can dominate this territory. The politics of this time, if you look at them, are distinctly libertarian in focus. There is a very deep distrust, typically, of existing systems, existing economic systems, existing political systems, existing governmental systems. People think that these rules for those systems no longer apply to what they're building. And they believe that the world that they're building will be a much different place than it currently is today. After that comes the standardization phase, what I call the standardization phase, and Deborah also calls the creative anarchy phase. And this is when, as the illustration here starts to demonstrate, the euphoria starts to peel off and uh, serious problems begin to surface that threaten both what has been built to date and how this new world fits into the existing world order. This is when you can think of the customer base starting to say, this isn't just something that I'd like to have and that I use in special purposes, but where a customer base begins to start to rely on this new technology for their day-to-day -day life. They, don't, they demand that the technology doesn't just exist, but that the technology exists and reliably works and interoperates the rest of what takes place in their lives. Of course, this intensifies the competition that's taking place in the space. Markets will begin to consolidate. Monopolies may result, uh, but importantly, there are beginning to hear the calls for what can be done about the kinds of harms that are coming out of the uses of these technologies. And when I talk about these harms, I'm talking about about both harms to individual consumers, but also harms being done to potential harms being done to competing businesses and the calls for something to be done because of these individual and competing business harms grow louder. And this is what allows us then to enter into the final phase, the regulation phase, um, which if you recall on our first phase, we couldn't imagine initially how some new technology, some new idea could actually have some rules put around it. Um, but now we're hearing calls and even from some of the largest players in this space who are dealing in this technological world if for regulations within their market, regulations that could protect the territories that they've built and the advantages that they have. Of course, if this is well, we can enter out of our, our 
problematic phase and enter back into a market that can continue to grow and prosper. I would claim that technology is value laden. The designers of systems can't be helped but be influenced by, for example, the designers of the software. What are their own personal beliefs? What values do they hold? What kinds of life experiences have they had that influenced the kinds of code that they wrote, the choices that they made in the interface, and so forth? This then leaks, influence then leaks into the kinds of products that we build, the products that we use. Even moreover, the designers of these technologies work in firms typically that have their own constraints around organizational, institutional, and political interests, all imbibed with their own values that then appear in the kinds of technologies that get built. Is this a problem for us? I personally don't think so. If we think about the ethics of what we build while we're both being trained and while we are building these things. On the other hand, if I think about technology as just a tool, if I think about it just being value neutral, then we may find that our technologies haven't just changed our world, but have actually broken it in some fundamental ways. I want to end with one last quote. Um, and in endowing the Mahindra Center, the Mahindra Humanities Center here at Harvard in 2011, Anand Mahindra, the billionaire Indian businessman, said this, conflict resolution and creating a better world do not come from an improved piece of software or a better engine or technology, but from people who can break free of their rigid points of view.